Section number 24 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1713 to 1755, Part 2. Late in 1744, Europe breaks into that flame of war known as the Austrian succession. Before either Quebec or Boston knows of open war, Louisbourg has word of it and sends her rangers burning fishing towns and battering at the rotten palisades of Annapolis, Port Royal. Port Royal is commanded by that same Paul Massacrine of former wars grown old in service. The French bid him save himself by surrender before their fleet comes. Though Massacre has less than a hundred men, the weather is in his favor. It is September. Winter will drive the invaders home, so he sends back word that he will bid his time till the hostile fleet comes. As for the Abbey Lolotra, let the treacherous priest beware how he brings his murderous Indians within range of the fort guns. Meanwhile, the Acadian habitants are threatened with death if they do not rise to aid the French, but they too bid their time, for if they rebel and fail, that too means death, and the neutrals refuse to stir till the invaders, from lack of provisions, are forced to decamp and the Abbey Lelotra, with his black hat drawn down over his eyes, vanishes into forest with his crew of painted warriors. News of the war and of the ravaging of Acadian fishing towns sets Massachusetts in flame. To Boston, above all New England towns, was Louisburg a constant danger. The thing seemed absolute stark madness. The thoughtless daring of full-hearted enthusiasts, but it is ever enthusiasm which accomplishes the impossible, and April 30, 1745, after only seven weeks of preparation, an English fleet of sixty-eight ships, some accounts say ninety, including the whalers and transports gathered along the coast towns, sails into Gabonus Bay behind Louisburg where the waters have barely cleared of ice. William Pepperneal, a merchant, commands the four thousand raw levies of provincial troops. The most of them have never stepped to martial music before in their lives. Admiral Warren has come up from West India waters with his men of war to command the United Fleets. Early Monday morning, against a shore wind, the boats are tacking to land when the alarm bells begin ringing and ringing at Louisburg and a force of 150 men dashes down shore for Flat Cove to prevent the landing. Pepperneal outtricks the enemy by leaving only a few boats to make a feign of landing at the cove, while he swings his main fleet inshore round a bend in the coast a mile away. Here, with prodigious rattling of lowered sails and anchor chains, the crews plunge over the rolling waves, pontooning a bridge of small boats ashore. By nightfall most of the English have landed, and spies report the harbour of Louisbourg alive with torches, where the French are sinking ships to obstruct the entrance and setting fire to fishing stages that might interfere with cannon aim. The next night, May 1st, Vaughan's New Hampshire boys, raw farmers, shambling in their gait, singing as they march, swing through the woods along the marsh behind the fort, and take up a position on a hill to the far side of Louisburg, creating an enormous bonfire with the French tar and ships tackling stored here. The result of this harmless maneuver was simply astounding. It will be recalled that Louisburg had an outer battery of forty cannon on this side. The French soldiers holding this battery mistook the bonfire for the English attacking forces, and under cover of darkness abandoned the position. 
battery, guns, powder, and all, which the English promptly seized. This was the royal battery which commanded the harbor and could shell into the very heart of the fort. The next thing for the English was to get their heavy guns ashore through a rolling surf of ice-cold water. For two weeks the men stood by turns to their necks in their surf, steadying the pontoon gangway as the great cannon were trundled ashore, and this was the least of their difficulties. The next question was how to get their cannon across the marsh behind the fort to the hill on the far side. The cannon would sink from their own weight in such a bog, and either horses or oxen would flounder to death in a few minutes. Again, the foolhardy enthusiasm of the raw levies overcame the difficulty. They built large stone boats, raft-shaped, such as are used on farms to haul stones over ground too rough for wagons. Hitching to these teams of two hundred men stripped to mid-waist, they laboriously hauled the cannon across the quaking moss to the hills commanding the rear of the fort, bombs and balls whizzing overhead all the while, fired from the fort bastions. It was cold, damp spring weather. The men who were not soaked to their necks in surf and bog were doing picket duty along shore, sleeping in their boots. Consequently, in three weeks, half of Pepperell's force became deadly ill. At this time, within two days, occurred both a cheering success and a disheartening rebuff. A French man-of-war with seventy cannon and six hundred men was seen entering Louisbourg, as if in panic fright one of the small English ships fled. The French ship pursued. In a trice she was surrounded by the English fleet and captured. The flight of the little vessel had been a trick. A few days later, Four hundred English in whaleboats attempted the mad project of attacking the island battery at the harbor entrance. The boats set out about midnight with muffled oars, but a wind rose, setting a tremendous surf lashing the rocks, and yet the invaders might have succeeded but for a piece of rashness. A hundred men had gained the shore when, with the thoughtlessness of schoolboys, they uttered a jubilant yell instantly porthole platform galley belched death through the darkness the story is told that a raw new england lad was in the act of climbing the french flagstaff to hang out his own red coat as english flag when a swiss guard hacked him to pieces the boats not yet ashore were sunk by the blaze of cannon a few escaped back in the darkness but by daylight over one hundred English had been captured. Cannon, mortars, and musketoons were mounted to command the fort inside the walls, and a continuous rain of fire began from the hills. In vain, Dutch Chamblon, the French commander, waited for reinforcements from Canada. Convent, hospital, barracks, all the houses of the town were peppered by bombs till there was not a roof intact in the place. The soldiers, of whom there were barely two thousand, were ready to mutiny. The citizens besought Duchamon to surrender. Provisions ran out. Looking down from the tops of the walls, cracking jokes with the English across the ditch, the French soldiers counted more than a thousand scaling ladders ready for hand-to-hand -hand assault and a host of barrels filled with mud behind which the English sharpshooters crouched. It had just been arranged between Warren and Pepperell that the former should attack by sea, while the latter assaulted by land, when on June sixteenth the French capitulated. How the New England enthusiasts ran rampant through the abandoned French fort need not be told. How Parson Moody, famous for his long prayers, hewed down images in the Catholic chapel till he was breathless and then came to the officer's state dinner so exhausted that when he was asked to pronounce blessing he could only mutter, Good Lord, we have seen so much to thank thee for, 
time is too short we must leave it to eternity amen how the new englanders unused to french wines drank themselves torpid on the stores of the fort cellar how the french the next year made superhuman effort to regain louisbourg only to have a magnificent fleet of one hundred and fifty sail wrecked on sable island duke de anville the commander dying of heartbreak on his ship anchored near halifax his successor killing himself with his own sword cannot be told here louisbourg was the prize of the war and england threw the prize away by giving it back to france in the treaty of Aux la chapelle in 1748 the english government paid back the colonies for their outlay but of all the rich french pirate ships loaded with booty captured at louisbourg by leaving the french flag flying not a penny's worth went to the provincial troops warren seamen received all the loot like all preceding treaties the peace of aux la chapelle left unsettled the boundaries between new france and new england in acadia in new york on the ohio collisions were bound to come in acadia the english sent their officers to the isthmus of chicanacto to establish a fort near the bounds of what are now nova scotia and new brunswick the priestly spy louis joseph le lotre led his wild micmac savages through the farm settlement round the english fort setting fire to houses putting a torch even to the church and so compelling the habitants of the boundary to come over to the french and take sides the treaty has restored louisbourg to the french but the very next year england sends out edward cornwallis with two thousand settlers to establish the english fort now known as halifax by seventeen fifty two there are four thousand people at the new fort though the indian raiders miss no occasion to shoot down wayfarers and farmers and the french governor at quebec continues his bribes as many as eight hundred dollars a year to a man to stir up hostility to the english and prevent the acadian farmers taking oath of fidelity to england so much for the peace treaty in acadia it was not peace it was farce in new york state matters were worse the iroquois had been acknowledged allies of the english and before 1730 the english fort at oswego had been built at the southeast corner of lake ontario to catch the fur trade of the northern tribes coming down the lakes to new france and to hold the iroquois friendship also as french traders pass up the lake to fort frontenac kingston and niagara with their national flag flying from the prow of canoe and flatboat chance bullets from the english fort ricocheted across the advancing prows and soldiers on the galleries inside fort oswego take bets on whether they can hit the french flag prompt as a gamester new france checkmates this move Peter Schuller has been setting English farmers round Lake Champlain. At Crown Point, long known as Scalp Point, where the lake narrows and a portage runs across Lake George and the Mohawk land, the French, in 1731, erect a strong fort. As for the English traders at Fort Oswego, catching the tribes from the north, New France, counterchecks that by sending Port Neuf in April of 1749, only a year after the peace, to the Toronto portage where the Indians come from the upper lakes by way of Lake Simcoe. What is now known as Toronto is named Rouel, after a French minister, and if this were not checkmate enough to the English advancing westward, the Sulpinian priest from Montreal, Abbe Piquet, zealously builds a fort straight north of oswego on the south side of the st lawrence to keep the iroquois loyal to france piquet calls his fort presentation his enemies call it piquet's folly it is known to-day as 
Ogdensburg. Look at the map. France's frontier line is guarded by forts that stand like sentinels at the gateways to all waters leading to the interior. Ogdensburg, Kingsington, Toronto, Niagara, Detroit, Michilmackinac, and the Verendre's string of forts far west as the Rockies. New York's frontier line is guarded by one fort only, Oswego. Here, too, as in Acadia, the peace is a farce. But it was in the valley of the Ohio where the greatest struggle over boundaries took place. One year after the peace, Celeron de Bienville is sent in July 1749 to take possession of the Ohio for France. France claims right to this region by virtue of La Salle's explorations sixty years previously, and all those bush rangers who have roved the wilds from Great Lakes to Louisiana. Small token did France take of La Salle's exploits while he lived, but the great store do her statesmen set by his voyages now that he has been sixty years dead. But pause, commands the English governor of Virginia, since time immemorial have our traders wandered over the great smoky mountains over the cumberlands over the alhanese down the tennessee and the kanawha and the monagalea and the ohio to the mississippi as a matter of fact one major general wood had in sixteen seventy and sixteen seventy four sent his men overland if not far as the mississippi then certainly as far as the Ohio and the valley of the Mississippi. But Wood was a private adventurer. For years his exploit had been forgotten. No record of it remained but an account written by his men, Batts and Hallam. The French declared the record was a myth, and it has, in fact, been so regarded by the most of historians. Yet, curiously enough, ranging through some old family papers of the Hudson Bay Company in the public records, London, I found, with Wood's own signature, his record of the trip across the mountains to the Indians of the Ohio and Mississippi. It is probable that the English cared quite as much for claims founded on La Salle's voyage as the French cared for claims founded on the horseback trip of Major General Wood's men. The fact remained, here were the English traders from Virginia pressing northward by way of the Ohio. Here were the French adventurers pressing south by way of the Ohio. As in Acadia and New York, peace or no peace, a clash was inevitable. Du Quesnes has come out governor of Canada, and by 1753 has dispatched a thousand men into the Ohio Valley who blaze a trail through the wilderness and string a line of forts from Pisque Isle, Erie, on Lake Erie, southward to Fort du Canesque at the junction of the Algony and Monongahela, where Pittsburgh stands today. One December night at Fort Le Boeuf, on the trail to the Ohio, the French commandant was surprised to see a slim youth of twenty years ride out of the rain-drenched leafless woods, followed by four or five whites and Indians with a string of belled pack horses. The young gentleman introduces himself with great formality, though he must use an interpreter, for he does not speak French. He is Major George Washington, sent by Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia to know why the French have been seizing the fur posts of English traders in this region. The French commander, St. Pierre, receives the young Virginian courteously, plies master and men with such lavish hospitality that Washington has much trouble to keep his drunken Indians from deserting, and dismisses his visitor with the smooth but bootless response that as France and England are at peace he cannot answer Governor Dinwiddie's message till he has heard from the governor of Canada, Marquis de Cunesse. Not much satisfaction for emissaries who had forded ice-rafted rivers 
and had tramped the drifted forests for three hundred miles. By January 1754, Washington is back in Virginia. By May, he is on the trail again, blazing a path through the wilderness down the Monongahela towards the French fort, for what purpose one may guess, though these were times of piping peace. Come an old Indian chief, an English bushwhacker, one morning with word that fifty French raiders are on the trail ten miles away. For what purpose, one may guess, spite of peace. Instantly Washington sends half a hundred Virginia frontiersmen out scouting. They find no trace of raiders, but the old chief picks up the trail of the ambushed French. Here they had broken branches going through the woods. Then a moccasin track punctures the spongy mold. Here leaves have been scattered to hide camp ashes. At midnight, with the rain slashing through the forest black as pitch, Washington sets out with forty men following his Indian guide. Through the dark they feel rather than follow the trail, and it is a slow but easy trick to those acquainted with wildwood travel. Leave the path by as much as the foot length and the foliage lashes you back, or the windfall trips you up, or the punky path becomes punctured beneath moccasin tread. By day dawn, misty and gray in the May woods, the English are at the Indian camp and march forward, escorted by the redskins, single file, silent as ghosts, alert as tigers. Rain drip washes on the buckskin coats. Muskets are loaded and carefully cased from the wet. The old chief stops suddenly and points. There lie the French in a rock ravine sheltered by the woods like a cave. The next instant the French had leaped up with a whoop. Washington shouted, Fire! When the smoke of the musket crash cleared, ten French lay dead, among them their officer, Jumonville, and twenty-two others surrendered. No need to dispute whether Washington was justified in firing on thirty bushrovers in time of peace. The bushrovers had already seized English forts and were even now scouring the country for English traders. For a week their scouts had followed Washington as spies. Expecting instant retaliation from Fort Duquesne, Washington retreated swiftly to his camping place at Great Meadows and cast up a log barricade known as Fort Necessity. A few days later comes a company of regular troops. By July 1st he has some 400 men, but at Fort Duquesne are 1,400 French. The French wait only for orders from Quebec, then march 900 bushrovers against Washington. July 3rd, towards midday, they burst from the woods, whooping and yelling. Washington chose to meet them on open ground, but the French were pouring a crossfire over the meadow, and to compel them to attack in the open. Washington drew his men behind the barricade. By nightfall the Virginians were out of powder. Twelve had been killed, and forty-three were wounded. By midnight the French beat a parley. All they desired was that the English evacuate the fort. To fight longer would have risked the extermination of Washington's troops. Terms of honorable surrender were granted, and the next day, the day which Washington was to make immortal, July 4th, the English retreated from Fort Necessity. Such was the peace in the Ohio Valley. Though the peace is still continued, English dispatches in 1755 two regiments of the line under Major General Braddock to protect Virginia, along with a fleet of twelve men of war under Admiral Boscawan. France keeps up the farce by sending out Baron Dieskau with three thousand soldiers and Admiral Lamont with eighteen ships. Coasting off Newfoundland, the English encounter three of the French ships that have gone astray in the fog. Is it peace or war? shout the French across the decks. Peace, answers a voice from the English deck, and, and instantaneously a hurricane cannonade rakes the decks of the French, killing eighty. 
Two of the French ships surrendered. The other escaped through the fog. Such was the peace. So began the famous Seven Years' War, and Major General Baddock, in session with the colonial governors, plans the campaign that is to crush New France's pretensions south of the Great Lakes. Acadia, Lake Champlain, the Ohio, these are to be the theaters of the contest. Braddock himself, accompanied by Washington, marches with 2,200 men over the Algonies along the old trail of the Monogahanlia against Fort du Conness. Of Braddock, the least said the better. A gambler, full of arrogant contempt towards all people and things that were not British, hail fellow well met to his boon companions heartless towards all outside the pale of his own pride a blustering bully yet dogged and withal a gentleman after the standard of the age he was neither better nor worse than the times in which he lived of braddock's men fifteen hundred were british regulars the rest virginian bush fighters and the redcoat troops held such contempt towards the buckskin frontiersmen that friction arose from the first about the relative rank of regulars and provincials from the time they set out the troops had been retarded by countless delays there was trouble buying up supplies of beef cattle among the frontiermen scouts scoured the country for horses and wagons to haul the great guns and heavy artillery Braddock's high mightiness would take no advice from colonels about single file march on a bush trail and swift raids to elude ambushed foes. Everything proceeded slowly, ponderously, with the system and routine of an English guard room. Scouts to the fore and on both flanks, three hundred bushwhackers went ahead, widening the bridle path to a twelve foot road for wagons and along this road moved the troops five and six abreast the red coats agleam through the forest foliage drums rolling flags flying steps keeping time as if on parade braddock and his officers mounted on spirited horses the heavy artillery and supply wagons lagging far behind in a winding line end of section twenty four Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 25 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1713 to 1755, Part 3 What happened has been told times without number in story and history. It was what the despised colonials feared and any bushranger could have predicted. July 9th in stifling heat, the marchers had come to a loop in the Mongonahala River. Braddock thought to avoid the loop by fording twice. He was now within eight miles of Fort Duquesnesc, the modern Pittsburgh. Though Indian raiders had scalped some wanderers from the trail, and insolent messages had been occasionally found scrawled in French on birch trees, not a Frenchman had been seen on the march. The advance guard had crossed the second ford about midday when the road markers at a little opening beyond the river saw a white man clothed in buckskin but wearing an officer's badge dash out of the woods to the fore, wave his hat, and disappear. A moment later the well-known war whoop of the French bush rovers tore the air to tatters, and bullets rained from ambush foes in a sheet of fire. In vain the English drums rolled and rolled, and soldiers shouted, The King! God save the King! 
One officer tried to rally his men to rush the woods, but they were shot down by a torrent of bullets from an unseen foe. The Virginian bushfighters alone knew how to meet such an emergency. Jumping from tree to tree for shelter, like Indians dancing sideways to avoid the enemy's aim, they had broken from rank to fight in bushman fashion when Braddock came galloping furiously from the rear and ordered them back in line. What use was military rank with an invisible foe? As well shoot air as an unseen Indian. Again the Virginians broke rank, and the regulars, huddled together like cattle in the shambles, fired blindly and succeeded only in hitting their own provincial troops. Braddock stormed and swore and rode like a fury incarnate, roaring orders which no one could hear, much less obey. Five horses were shot under him, and the dauntless commander had mounted a fresh one when the big guns came plunging forward, but the artillery on which Braddock had pinned his faith only ploughed pits in the forest mold. Of eighty officers, sixty had fallen, and like proportion of men. Braddock ordered a retreat. The march became a panic, the panic frenzied terror. The men who had stood so solidly under withering fire now dashing in headlong flight from the second to the first ford and back over the trail, breathless as if pursued by demons. Artillery, cattle, supplies, dispatch boxes, all were abandoned. Washington's clothes had been riddled by bullets, but he had escaped injury. Braddock reeled from his horse mortally wounded to be carried back on a litter to that scene of Washington's surrender the year before. Four days later, the English general died there. Of the English troops, more than a thousand lay dead, blistering in the July sun, maimed and scalped by the Indians. Braddock was buried in his soldier's coat beside the trail, all signs of the grave effaced to prevent vandalism. Of all the losses, the most serious were the dispatch boxes, for they contained the English plans of campaign from Acadia to Niagara, and were carried back to Fort Duquesne, where they put the French on guard. The jubilant joy at the French fort need not be described. When he heard of the English advance, Contracure, the commander, had been cooped up with less than one thousand men, half of whom were Indians. Had Braddock once reached Fort Duquesne, he could have starved it into surrender without firing a gun, or shelled it into kindling wood with his heavy artillery. Bougeau, an officer under Contracure, had volunteered to go out and meet the English. My son, my son, will you walk into the arms of death? demanded the Indian chiefs. My fathers, will you allow me to go alone? answered Bougeau, and out he sallied with six hundred picked men. It was Bougeau whom Braddock's men had seen dash out and wave his hat. The brave Frenchman fell, shot at the first volley from the English, and his Indian friends avenged his death by roasting thirty English prisoners alive. The Isthmus of Chignacto, or the boundary between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, was the scene of the borderland fights in Acadia. To narrate half the forays, raids, and ambuscades would require a volume. Fights as gallant as Dollard's at the Salt, waged from Beaujour, the French fort north of the boundary, to Grand Pre and Annapolis, where the English were stationed. After the founding of Halifax, the Abbey Le Lotre, whose false, foolish counsels had so often endangered the habitant farmer, moved his mission in the center of Acadia up to Beaujolais on the New Brunswick side. Here he could be seen with his Indians toiling like a demon over the trenches. When Moncton, the English general, came 
on june first eighteen fifty five with the british fleet to land his forces at fort lawrence the english post on the south side colonel lawrence was now english governor of acadia and he had decided with monkton that once and for all the french of acadia must be subjugated the french of beaujolais had in all less than fifteen hundred men half of whom were simple acadian farmers forced into unwilling service by the priest's threats of indian raid in this world and damnation in the next day dawn of june fourth the bugles blew to arms and english forces some four thousand had marched to the south shore of the missagash river where the french on the north side uttered a whoop and emitted a clatter of shots black-hatted sinister tireless the priest could be seen urging his indians on the english brought up three field cannon and under protection of their scattering fire laid a pontoon bridge crossing the river they marched within a mile of the fort that night the sky was alight with flame for vergor the french commander and abbot le Lotre set fire to all houses outside the fort walls in a few days the english cannon had been placed in a circle round the fort and set such strange music humming in the ears of the besieged that the acadian farmers deserted and the priests nervously thought of flight louisburg could send no aid and still the bombs kept bursting through the roofs of the fort houses one morning a bomb crashed through the roof of the breakfast room killing six officers on the spot and the french at once hung out the white flag but when the english troops marched in on june sixteenth at seven in the evening le Lotre had fled overland through the force of new brunswick for quebec their scant welcome awaited the renegade priest the french governors had been willing to use him as their tool at a price eight hundred dollars a year but when the tool failed of its purpose they cast him aside le Lotre sailed for france but his ship was captured by an english cruiser and he was imprisoned for eight years on the island of jersey meanwhile how was fate dealing with the acadian farmers ever since the treaty of utrecht they had been afraid to take the oath of unqualified loyalty to england lest new france or rather abbe le lotre let loose the hounds of indian massacre on the peaceful settlements besides had not the priest assured them year in and year out that france would recover acadia and put the sword those habitants who had forsworn france and they had been equally afraid to side with the french for in case of failure the burden of punishment would fall on them alone for almost half a century they had been known as neutrals of their population of twelve thousand three thousand had been lured away to prince edward island and cape breton when cornwallis had founded halifax he had intended to wait only till the english were firmly established when he would demand an oath of unqualified allegiance from the acadians they on their part were willing to take the oath with one proviso that they should never be required to take up arms against the french or they would have been willing to leave acadia as the treaty of utrecht had provided in case they did not take the oath of allegiance but in the early days of english possession the english governors were not willing they should leave if the acadians had migrated it would simply have strengthened the french in cape breton and prince edward island and new brunswick obstructions had been created that prevented the supply of transports to move the acadians the years had drifted on and a new generation had grown up knowing nothing of treaty rights but only that the french were threatening them on one side 
if they did not rise against England, and the English on the other side if they did not take oath of unqualified allegiance. Cornwallis had long since left Halifax, and Lawrence, the English governor, while loyal to a fault, was, like Braddock, that type of English understrapper who had wrought such irreparable injury to English prestige purely from lack of sympathetic insight with colonial conditions. For years before he had become governor, Lawrence's days had been embittered by the intrigues of the French with the Acadian farmers. He had been in Halifax when the Abbey La Lotra's Indian brigands had raided and slain as many as thirty workmen at a time near the English fort. He had been at the Isthmus of Chignetto that fatal morning when some Indians dressed in the suits of French officers waved a white flag and lured Captain Howe of the English fort across stream where they shot him under flag of truce in cold blood. These are not excuses for what Lawrence did. Nothing can excuse the infamy of his policy towards the Acadians. There are few blacker crimes in the history of the world, but these facts explain how a man of Lawrence's standing could assume the responsibility he did. In addition, Lawrence was a bigoted Protestant. He not only hated the Acadians because they were French, he hated them as a colony of rattlesnakes because they were Catholics, and being an Englishman, he despised them because they were colonials. France and England were now on the verge of the great struggle for supremacy in America. Eighteen French frigates had come to Louisbourg and 3,000 French regulars to Quebec. If Lawrence did not yet know that Braddock had been defeated on July 9th at Duquesque, as his friends declare in his defense, it is a strange thing, for by August the bloody slaughter of the Monongahela was known everywhere else in America, from Quebec to New Spain. With Lawrence and Monckton and Murray and Boscawan and the other English generals sent to conduct the campaign in Acadia, the question was what to do with the French habitants. Let two facts be distinctly stated here and with great emphasis. First, the colonial officers, like Winslow from Massachusetts, knew absolutely nothing of the English officers' plans. They were not admitted to the conferences of the English officers and were simply expected to obey orders. Second, the English government knew absolutely nothing of the English officers' course till it was too late for remedy. In fact, later dispatches of that year inquire sharply what Lawrence meant by an obscure threat to drive the Acadians out of the country. Did a darker or more sinister motive underlie the policy of Lawrence and his friends? Poems, novels, histories have waged war of words over this. Only the facts can be stated. Land to the extent of 20,000 acres each, which had belonged to the Acadians, was ultimately deeded to Lawrence and his friends. Charges of corruption against Lawrence himself were lodged with the British government, both by mail and by personal delegates from Halifax. Unfortunately, Lawrence died in Halifax in 1760, before the investigation could take place, and whether true or false, the odium of the charges rests upon his fame. What he did with the Acadians is too well known to require telling, in secret conclave, the infamous edict was pronounced. Quick messengers were sent with secret dispatches to the officers of land forces and ships at Annapolis, at Mines, at Chignato, to repair to the towns of the Acadians, where, upon opening their dispatches, they would find their orders, which were to be kept a secret among the officers. The colonial officers, on reading their orders, were simply astounded. 
it is the most grievous affair that ever i was in in my life declared winslow the edict was that every man woman and child of the acadians should be forcibly deported in lawrence's words in such a way as to prevent the reunion of the colonists the men of the acadian settlements were summoned to the churches to hear the will of the king of england once inside doors were locked english soldiers placed on guard with leveled bayonet and the edict read by an officer standing on the pulpit stairs or on a table the acadians were snared like rats in a trap outside were their families hostages for the peaceful conduct of the men inside were the brothers and husbands hostages for the good conduct of the families outside only in a few places was there any rioting and this was probably caused by the brutality of the officers murray and monkton and lawrence refer to their prisoners as popish recusants poor wretches rascals who have been bad subjects while the acadians were to be deported so they could never reunite as a colony it was intended to keep the families together and allow them to take on board what money and household goods they possessed but there were interminable delays for transports and supplies from september to december the deportation dragged on and when the acadians patient as sheep in the shambles became restless some of the ships were sent off with the men while the families were still on land in places the men were allowed ashore to harvest their crops and care for their stock but harvest and stock fell to the victors as burning hay racks and barns nightly lighted to flame the wooded background and placid seas of the fair acadian land before winter set in the acadians had been scattered from new england to louisiana a few people in the chignotto region had escaped to the woods of new brunswick and one shipload overpowered its officers and fled to st john river but in all six thousand six hundred people were deported it is the blackest crime that ever took place under the british flag and the expulsion was only the beginning of the sufferers woes some people found their way to quebec but quebec was destitute and in the throes of war the wanderers came to actual starvation the others wandered homeless in boston in new york in philadelphia in louisiana after the peace of seventeen sixty three some eight hundred gathered together in boston and began the long march overland through the forests of maine and new brunswick to return to acadia singing hymns dragging their baggage on sleighs pausing to hunt by the way these sad pilgrims toiled more than one thousand miles through forest and swamp and at the end of two years found themselves back in acadia but they were like ghosts of the dead revisiting scenes of childhood their lands were occupied by new owners of their herds not remain but the bleaching bone heaps where the lowing cattle had huddled in winter storms new faces filled their old houses strange children rambled beneath the little dormer windows of the acadian cottages and the voices of boys at play in the apple orchards shouted in an alien tongue the very names of the places had vanished beaujour was now cumberland beau basin had become amherst coquid was now truo grand pre was now known as horton the heartbroken people hurried on like ghosts to the unoccupied lands of st mary's bay st mary's bay where long ago priest aubrey had been lost here they settled to hew out for themselves a second home in the wilderness it will be recalled that braddock's plans had been captured by the french and those plans told baron dieskau 
who had come out to command the French troops, that the English under William Johnson, a great leader of the Iroquois, injured to bush life like an Indian, were to attack the French fort at Crown Point on Lake Champlain. Now observe, on the Ohio, Braddock the regular had been defeated. In Acadia, Lawrence and Monckton and Murray, the English generals, had brought infamy across England's renown by their failure to understand colonial conditions. At Lake Champlain, the conditions are reversed. Johnson, the English leader, is, from long residence in America, almost a colonial. Dieskau, the commander of the French, is a veteran of Saxon wars, but knows nothing of bush fighting. What happens? Dixau had intended to attack the English at Oswego, but the plans for Johnson on Lake Champlain brought the commander of the French rushing up the Richeau River with 3,000 soldiers, part regulars, part Canadians. Crown Point, called Fort Frederick by the French, was reached in August. No English are here, but scouts bring word that Johnson has built a fort on the south end of Lake George, and leaving only five hundred men to garrison it, is moving up the lake with his main troops. Fired by the French victories over Braddock, Dixau planned to capture the English fort and ambush Johnson on the march. Look at the map! The south end of Lake Champlain lies parallel with the north end of Lake George. The French can advance on the English one of two ways portage over to Lake George and canoe up the lake to Johnson's Fort, or ascend the marsh to the south of Lake Champagne, then cross through the woods to Johnson's Fort. De Salle chose the latter trail. Leaving half his men to guard the baggage, De Salle bade fifteen hundred picked men follow him on swiftest march with provisions in Haversack for only eight days. September 8th, 10 a.m., the marchers advance through the woods and Johnson's fort, when suddenly they learn that their scout has lied. Johnson himself is still at the fort. Instead of 500 are 4,000 English. Advancing along the trail, V-shape, regulars in the middle, Canadians and Indians on each side, the French come on a company of 500 English wagoners. In the wild melee of shouts, the English retreat in a rabble. Pursue, march, fire, force the place, yells Dixau. Dashing forward, sword in hand, thinking to follow so closely on the heels of the rabble that he can enter the English fort before the enemy know, but his Indians have forsaken him, and Johnson's scouts have forewarned the approach of the French. Instead of ambushing the English, Dixau finds his own army ambushed. He had sneered at the uninformed plowboys of the English. The more there are, the more we shall kill, he had boasted. But now he discovers that the rude bushwhackers, who fought like boys in the morning, at noon fought like men, and by afternoon fought like devils, their sharpshooters kept up a crash of fire to the fore, and fifteen hundred doubled on the rear of his army, folding us up, he reported, like a pack of cards. Dixau fell, shot in the leg and in the knee, and a bullet struck the cartridge box of the servant who was washing out the wounds. Lay my telescope and coat by me and go, ordered Dixau. This is as good a deathbed as any place. Go, he thundered, seeing his second officer hesitate. Don't you see you are needed? Go and sound a retreat. A third shot penetrated the wounded commander's bladder. Lying alone, propped against a tree, he heard the drums rolling a retreat when one of the enemy jumped from the woods with pointed pistol. Scoundrel, roared the dauntless de Sau dare to shoot a man weltering in his blood. The fellow proved to be a Frenchman who had long ago deserted to the English, 
and he muttered out some excuse about shooting the devil before the devil shot him but when he found out who Dixell was he had him carried carefully to johnson's tent where every courtesy was bestowed upon the wounded commander johnson himself lay wounded all that night iroquois kept breaking past the guard into the tent what do they want asked de Sau feebly to skin you and eat you returned johnson lactonically whose was the victory the losses had been about even two hundred and fifty on each side johnson had failed to advance to crown point but de Sau had failed to dislodge johnson if de Sau had not been captured it is a question if either side would have considered the fight a victory as it was new france was plunged in grief joy bells rang in new england johnson was given a baroncy and five thousand pounds for his victory he had named the lake south of lake champlain after the english king lake george so closed the first act in the tragic struggle for supremacy in america end of section 25 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 26 of canada the empire of the north this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1756 to 1763, Part 1 How stand both sides at the opening of the year 1756? on the verge of the seven years war the struggle for a continent there has been open war for more than a year but war is not formally declared until may eighteenth seventeen fifty six take acadia first the french have been expelled the infamous le lotre is still in prison in england and when he is released in seventeen sixty three he toils till his death in 1773, trying to settle the Acadian refugees on some of the French islands of the English Channel. The smiling farms of Grand Pre and Port Royal lie a howling waste. Only a small English garrison holds Annapolis, where long ago Marc L'Escorbeau and Champlain held happy revel and the seat of government has been transferred to Halifax, now a settlement and fort of some five thousand people. So much for the English. Across a narrow arm of the sea is Isle Royal, or Cape Breton, where the French are entrenched as a second Gibraltar in the fortress of Louisbourg. Since the Treaty of A. La Chapelle restored the fort to the French, Millions have been spent strengthening its walls, adding to its armaments, but Intendant Bigot has had charge of the funds, and Intendant Bigot has a sponge-like quality of absorbing all funds that flow through his hands. Cannon have been added, but there are not enough balls to go round. The walls have been repaired, but with false filling, sand in place of mortar, so that the first shatter of artillery will send them clattering down in wet plaster. Take the Ohio next. Beautiful River is the highway between New France and Louisiana. By Braddock's defeat, the English have been driven out to a man. Matters are a thousandfold worse than before, for the savage allies of the French now swarm down the bush road cut by Braddock's army and carry bloody havoc to all the frontier settlements of Pennsylvania and Virginia. How many pioneers perished in this border war will never be known. It is a tale itself, and its story is not part of Canada's history. 
George Washington was the officer in charge of a thousand bushfighters to guard this frontier. Take the valley of Lake Champlain. This is the highway of approach to Montreal north, to Albany south. Johnson has defeated Dieskau here, but neither side was strong enough to advance from the scene of battle into the territory of the enemy. The English take possession of Lake George and entrench themselves at the south end of Fort William Henry. Sir William Johnson strings a line of forts up the Mohawk River towards Oswego on Lake Ontario, and he keeps his forest rangers under the famous scout Major Robert Rogers, scouring the forest and mountain trails of Lake Champlain for French marauder and news of what the French are doing. Rogers' rangers, too, are a story by themselves, but a story which does not concern Canada. Skating and snowshoeing by winter, canoeing by night in summer, Roger passed and repassed the enemy's lines times without number, as if his life were charmed, though once his wrist was shot when he had nothing to staunch the blood but the ribbon tying his wig, and once he stumbled back exhausted to Fort William Henry, to lie raging with smallpox for the winter. Among the forest rangers of New Hampshire and New York, Major Robert Rogers was without a peer. No danger was too great, no feat too daring for his band of scouts. The English have established Fort William Henry at the south end of Lake George. The French checkmate the move by strengthening Crown Point on Lake Champlain and moving a pace farther south into English territory, to Carillon, where the waters of Lake George pour into Champlain. Here on a high angle between the river and the lake, commanding all travel north and south, the French build Carillon or Fort Ticarondoga. As for the great northwest, New France with her string of posts, Frontenac, Niagara, Detroit, Michilmackinac, Kamaisqua, Fort William, Fort Rogue, Winnipeg, Portage La Prairie, stretches clear across to the foothills of the Rockies. The English fur traders of Hudson Bay have, in 1754, sent Anthony Hendry up the Saskatchewan, but when Henry comes back with word of equestrian Indians, the Blackfeet on horseback and treeless plains, the English set him down as a lion impostor. Indians on horseback? They had never seen Indians but in canoes and on snowshoes. Hendry was dismissed as unreliable, and no Englishman went up the Saskatchewan for another ten years. If the disasters of 1755 did nothing more, they at least stirred the home governments to action. Earl Loudon is sent out in 1756 to command the English, and to New France in May comes Louis Joseph, Marquis de Montcalm, age 44, soldier, scholar, country gentleman, with a staff composed of Chevalier de Levy, Bourlamac, and one Bougainville, to become famous as a navigator. Though New France consists of a good three-quarters of America, things are in evil plight that causes Montcalm many sleepless nights. Vaudreuil, the French governor, descendant of that Vaudreuil who long ago set the curse of Indian warfare on the borders of New England, had expected to be appointed chief commander of the troops, and jealousy resents Montcalm's coming. With the governor is lead intendant Bigot, come up from Louisbourg. Bigot is a man of sixty, of noble birth, a favorite of the butterfly women, who rules the king of France, the Pompadour, and he has come to New France to mend his fortunes. How he planned to do it one may guess from his career at Louisbourg, but Quebec offered better field, and it was to Bigot's interest to ply Montcalm and Vaudreuil with such tittle-tattle of enemy as would foremont jealousy keep their attention on each other and their eyes off his own doings. 
as he had done at louisbourg so he now did at quebec the king was requisitioned for enormous sums to strengthen the fort bigot's ring of friends acted as contractors the outlay was enormous the results trifling i think complained the king that quebec must be fortified in gold it has cost so much it was time of war enormous sums were to be expended for presents to keep the indians loyal and the king complains that he cannot understand how baubles of beads and powder horns cost so much or how the western tribes seem to be more and more numerous or how the french officers who distribute the presents become millionaires in a few years a friend of bigot's handled these funds there are meat contracts for the army a worthless low-bred scamp is named commissary general he handles these contracts and he too swiftly graduates into the millionaire class is hail fellow met with bigot drinks deep at the intergent's table and gambles away as much as forty thousand dollars in a single night it is time of war and it is time of famine too for the crops have failed each inhabitant between the ages of fifteen and fifty has been drafted into the army not counting indians there is an army of fifteen to twenty thousand to be fed so bigot compels the habitants to sell him provisions at a low price these provisions he resells to the king for the army and to the citizens at famine prices the king's warehouse down by the intendant's palace becomes known as le frippon the cheat and though the country is on verge of ruin though poor people of the three towns are rioting in the streets for food old woman cursing the little wazened intendant with his pimpled face as he rolls past replenishing in carriage with horses whose harnesses is a blaze of silver the troops threatening to mutiny because they are compelled to use horse flesh though new france is hovering over a volcano of disaster they dance to their death thoughtless as butterflies gay as children these mannequin imitators of the french court who are ruining new france that they may copy the vices of an old world playing at kingcraft the regular troops are uniformed in white with facings of blue and red and gold and violet three-cornered hat and leather leggings to knee what with chapel bells ringing and ringing and bugle call and counter call echoing back from cape diamond what with Monsieur Bigot's prancing horses and Madame Pine's flashy carriage, Madame Pine, of whom Bigot is so enamored he has sent her husband to some far western post, and passes each evening at her gay receptions, what with the grounding of the sentry's arms and the parade of troops, Quebec is a gay place these years of black ruin, and the gossips have all they can do to keep track of the armoires and the duels and the high personages cultivating madame pine for cultivated she must be by all those who covet place or power a word from madame pine to bigot is of more value than a bribe even montcalm and de levy attend her revels twenty people sup with monsieur bigot each night either at the intendant's palace down by the charles river or nine miles out towards beauport where he has built himself the forest hermitage now known as chateau bigot a magnificent country manor of red brick hidden away among the hills with the gay shrubberies of french gardens set down in an american wilderness supper over by seven the guests sit down to play and the amount a man may gamble is his social barometer whether he lose or win cheat or steal if dancing follows gambling the rout will not disperse till seven in the morning what time is left of the twenty-four hours in a day will be devoted to public affairs 
Montcalm's salary is only 25,000 francs, or $5,000. To maintain the dignity of the king, the commander-in-chief must keep the pace, and he too gives weekly suppers, with places set for forty people, whom I don't know, he writes dejectedly to his wife, and don't want to know and wish that I might spend the evenings quietly in my own chamber. To Montcalm, who was of noble birth with no shamming, this low-bred pretense and play at courtcraft became a bore, to his staff of officers a source of continual amusement, but de Levy presently falls victim to a pair of fine eyes possessed by the wife of another man. War filled the summers, but the winters were given up to social life, and all midwinter social gaieties the most important was the official visit of the governor and the intendant to Montreal. By this time a good road had been cut from Quebec to Montreal along the North Shore, and the sleighs usually set out in January or February. Bigot added to the occasion all the prestige of a social route. All the grand dames and cavaliers of Quebec were invited. Baggage was sent on ahead with servants to break the way, find quarters for the night, and prepare meals. After dinner at the intendant's palace, the sleighs set out, two horses to each, driven tandem because the sleigh road was too narrow for a team. Each sleigh held only two occupants and to the damage done by fair eyes was added the glow of exhilaration from driving behind spirited horses in frosty air with the bells of a hundred carrioles ringing across the snow. At seven was pause for supper. High play followed till ten, then early to bed and early to rise and on the road again by seven in the morning. In Montreal was one continual round of dinners and dances. Between times, appointments were made to the military posts and trading stations of the upcountry. He who wanted a good post must pay his court to Madame Pien. No wonder Montcalm breathed a sigh of relief when Lent put a stop to the gaieties and he could quietly pass his evenings with the Salpinian priests. To break from Bigot's ring during the war was impossible. Creatures of his choosing filled the army, handled the supplies, controlled the Indians, and when the king's repoof became too sharp, Bigot simply threatened to resign, which wrought consultation, for no man of ability would attempt to unwind the tangle of Bigot's dishonesty during a critical war. Montcalm wrote home complaints in cipher. The French government bided its time, and Bigot tightened his vampire suckers on the lifeblood of the dying nation. The whole era is a theme for the allegatory of artist or poet. Montcalm had arrived in May of 1756. By midsummer he was leading 3,000 French artillerymen across Lake Ontario from Fort Frontenac, Kingston, to attack the English post on the south side, Oswego. Inside the fort walls were 700 raw English provincials, ill of scurvy from lack of food. The result needed scarcely to be told. 700 ill men behind wooden walls had no chance against 3,000 soldiers in health with heavy artillery. To take the English by surprise, Montcalm had crossed the lake on August 4th by night. Two days later, all the transport ships had landed the troops, and the cannon had actually been mounted before the English knew of the enemy's presence. On the east side of the river was Fort Ontario, a barricade of logs built in the shape of a star, housing an outguard of 370 men. On discovering the French, the sentry spiked their cannon, threw their powder in the river, and retired at midnight inside Oswego's walls. Working like beavers, Montcalm's men dragged twenty cannon to a hill commanding the fort, known as Fort Rascal, because the outfort there was useless to the English. Before Montcalm's cannonade, Oswego's walls, plastered with clay and rubble, 
fell like the staves of a dry barrel the english sharpshooters then hid behind pork barrels placed in three tiers filled with sand but colonel mercier their officer was literally cut in two by a cannon shot and the women cooped up inside the barracks begged the officers to avoid indian massacre by surrender a white flag was waved including women something under a thousand english surrendered themselves prisoners to montcalm the indians fell at once to mad plunder spite of the terms of honorable surrender the english were stripped of everything and only montcalm's promise of ten thousand dollars worth of presents to the savages prevented butchery the victors decamped to montreal well pleased with the campaign of seventeen fifty six it need not be told that there were constant raids and counter raids along the frontier during the entire year loudon the english commander did not arrive in new york till well on in midsummer of seventeen fifty six and he found far different material from the trained bushfighters in the hands of montcalm the english soldiers were raw provincial recruits dressed at best in buckskin but for the most part in the rough homespun which they had worn when they had left plough and carpenter's bench and fishing boat when montcalm was capturing oswego loudon was licking his rough recruits into shape making men out of mud for the campaign of seventeen fifty seven indeed it was said of loudon and the saying stuck to him as characteristic of his campaign that he resembled the wooden horse figure of a tavern sign always on horseback but never rode forward instead of striking at lake champagne or on the ohio where the french were the aggressors loudon planned to repeat the brilliant capture of louisburg july of eighteen fifty seven found him at halifax planting vegetable gardens to prevent scurvy the cabbage campaign as it was diversively called and waiting for gorham's rangers to reconnoitre louisburg gorham's scouts brought back word that the french admiral had come in with twenty-four men of war and seven thousand men to overpower such strength meant a prolonged siege it was already august loudon sailed back to new york without firing a gun while the english fleet trying to reconnoitre louisburg suffered terrible shipwreck montcalm was not the enemy to let chance of loudon's absence from the scene of action pass unimproved while loudon is pottering at halifax montcalm marshals his troops to the number of eight thousand including one thousand indians at carillon or ticonderoga where lake george empties into lake champlain portaging two hundred and fifty flatboats with as many birch canoes up the river the french invade the mountain wilderness of lake george towards the end of july la vie leads part of the troops by land up the west shore towards the english post of fort william henry montcalm advances on the lake with the flatboats and canoes and the rafts with the heavy artillery each night la vie's troops kindle their signal fires on the mountain slope and each night montcalm from the lake signals back with torches it needs artist's brush to paint the picture the forested mountains green and lonely and silent in the shimmering sunlight of the summer sky the lake gold as molten metal in the fire of the setting sun the soldiers in their gay uniforms of white and blue hoisting tent claws on oar sweeps for sails as a breeze dimples the waters the french voyageurs clad in beaded buckskin chanting some ditty of old world fame to the rhythmic dip of the indian paddles the indians naked painted for war with glitter in their eyes of a sinister intent which they have no mind to tell montcalm and then at the south of lake george nestled between the hills and the water the little palisaded fort fort william henry with gates fast shut and two thousand bushfighters behind the walls weak from an epidemic of smallpox 
and as usual so short of provisions that siege means starvation end of section number 26 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 27 of canada the empire of the north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox Dot org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1756 to 1763, Part 2 Twenty miles southeastward is another English fort, Fort Edward, where General Webb with 1,600 men is keeping the road barred against advance to albany soon as scouts bring word to fort william henry of the advancing french lieutenant monroe sends frantic appeal to webb for more men but webb has already sent all the men he can spare if he leaves fort edward the french by a flank movement through the woods can march on albany so monroe unplugs his seventeen cannon locks his gates and bids his fate montcalm follows the same tactics at oswego brings heavy artillery against slab walls for the first week of august eight hundred of his men are digging trenches by night to avoid giving target for the fiery bombs whizzing through the dark from monroe's cannon by day they lie hidden in the woods with a cordon of sharpshooters encircling the fort Montcalm encamped on the west to prevent help from Sir William Johnson up the Mohawk, Levy on the southeast to cut off aid from Webb. Monroe sends yet one last appeal for help. Two thousand men against eight thousand, the odds are eloquent of his need. Montcalm's scouts let this messenger pass through the lines as if unseen but they make a point of catching the return messenger and holding Webb's answer that he cannot come, till their cannon have torn great wounds in the fort walls. Then Bougainville, blindfold, carries Webb's answer to Monroe and demands the surrender of the fort. Monroe still has a little ammunition, still hopes against hope that Johnson or Webb or Loudon will come to the rescue and he keeps his big guns singing over the heads of the French in the trenches till all the cannon have burst but seven, and there are not ten rounds of shells left. Then Colonel Young, with a foot shot off, rides out on horseback waving a white flag. Three hundred English have been killed, as many again are wounded or ill of smallpox and to the remaining garrison of sixteen hundred montcalm promises safe conduct to general webb at fort edward then the english march out that night august ninth the vanquished english camp with montcalm's forces the indians meanwhile ramping through the fort for plunder have maddened themselves with traitor's rum before daybreak they have butchered all the wounded lying in the hospital and cut to pieces the men ill of smallpox a crime that brought its own punishment in contagion next morning when the french guard tried to conduct the disarmed english along the trail to fort edward the indians snatched at the clothing the haversacks the tent kit of the marchers with their swords the french beat back the drunken horde in answer the war hatchets were waved over the heads of the cowering women the march became a panic the panic a massacre and for twenty-four hours such bedlam raged as might have put fiends to shame the frenzied indians would listen to no argument but blows and when the english prisoners appealed to the french for protection the french dared not offend their savage allies by fighting to protect the English victims. 
take to the woods they warned the men and the women were quickly huddled back to shelter of the fort of the men sixty were butchered on the spot and some seven hundred captured to be held for ransom the remnant of the english soldiers along with the women were held till indian frenzy had spent itself then sent to fort edward august sixteenth a torch was put to the combustibles of the fort ruins and as the french boats glided out on lake george for the st lawrence explosion after explosion flame leaping above flame proclaimed that of fort william henry there would remain naught but ashes and charred ruins and the skeletons of the dead so closed the campaign of seventeen fifty seven for three years hand running england had suffered defeat the spring of seventeen fifty eight witnessed a change the change was the rise to power of a man who mastered circumstances instead of allowing them to master him such men are the milestones of human progress whether heroes or quiet toilers unknown to the world the man was pitt the english statesman instead of a weak ministry fighting the machinations of france it was now pitt versus pompadour the english patriot against the light women who ruled the councils of france from fighting weakly on the defensive england sprang into the position of aggressor all along the line the french were to be attacked at all points simultaneously at louisbourg on the east at ticaronda or carillon on lake champlain at duquesnes on the ohio at frontenac on lake ontario and finally at quebec itself london is recalled as commander-in-chief abercrombie succeeds to the position with the brilliant young soldier lord howe as right-hand man but pitt takes good care that there shall be good chiefs and good right-hand men at all points the one mistake is abercrombie mrs nabby crombie the soldiers called him he was an indifferent negative sort of man and indifferent negative sorts of people by their dishwater goodness can sometimes do more harm in critical positions than the branded criminal red tape had forced him on pitt but pitt trusted to the excellence of the subordinate officers especially lord howe louisburg first no more dilly-dallying and delay to plant cabbages the thing is to reach louisburg before the french have entered the harbor men of war are stationed to intercept the french vessels coming from the mediterranean and before winter has passed admiral bosquin has sailed for america with one hundred and fifty vessels including forty men of war frigates and transports carrying twelve thousand men general amherst is to command the land forces and with amherst is brigadier james wolfe aged thirty one a tall slim fragile man whose delicate frame is tenanted by a lion spirit or to change the comparison by a motive power too strong for the weak body that held it by may the fleet is in halifax by june amherst has joined bosquin and the ships beat out for louisburg through heavy fog with a sea that boils over the reefs in angry surf louisburg was in worse condition than during the siege of seventeen forty five the broken walls have been repaired but the filling is false sand grit its population is some four thousand of whom three thousand eight hundred are the garrison on the ships lying in the harbor are three thousand marines a defensive force in all six thousand eight hundred on walls and in bastions are some four hundred and fifty heavy guns cannon and mortars imagine a triangle with the base to the west the two sides running out to sea on the east 
The fort is the apex. The wall of the baseline is protected by a marsh. On the northeast side is the harbor protected by reefs and three batteries. Along the south side, Drucourt, the French commander, has stationed 2,000 men at three different points where landing is possible to construct batteries behind barricades of logs. Fog had concealed the approach of the English, but such a ground swell was raging over the reefs as threatened any ship with instant destruction. For a week Amherst and Wolfe and Lawrence row up and down through the rolling mist and raging surf and singing winds to take stock of the situation. With those batteries at the landing places there is only one thing to do, cannonade them. Hold their attention in a life and death fight while the English soldiers scramble through the surf for the shore. From sunrise to sundown of the 8th, furious cannonading set the green seas churning and tore up the French barricades as by hurricane. At sunset the firing ceased, and three detachments of troops launched out in whaleboats at three in the morning, two of the detachments to make a fiend of landing, while Wolfe with the other division was to run through the surf for the shore at Freshwater Cove. The French were not deceived. They let Wolfe approach within range, when the log barricade flashed to flame with a thousand sharpshooters. Wolfe had foreseen the snare and had waved his troops off when he noticed that two boatloads were rowing ashore through a tremendous surf under shelter of a rocky point. Quickly he signaled the other boats to follow. In a trice the boats had smashed a kindling on the reefs, but the men were wading ashore, muskets held high overhead powder pouches in teeth, and rushed with bayonets leveled against the French, who had dashed from cover to prevent the landing. This unexpected landing had cut the French off from Louisbourg. Retreating in panic, they abandoned their batteries and fifty dead. The English had lost one hundred and nine in the surf. It is said that Wolfe scrambled from the water like a drowned rat and led the rush with no other weapon in hand but his cane. To land the guns through the jostling sea was the next task. It was done, as in 1745, by a pontoon bridge of small boats, but the work took till the 29th of June. Wolfe, meanwhile, has marched with 1,200 men round to the rear of the marsh and come so suddenly on the Grand and Lighthouse batteries, which defend the harbor, that the French abandon them to retreat within the walls. This gives the English such control of the harbor entrance that Ducourt, the French commander, sinks six of his ships across the channel to bar out Boscawan's fleet, the masts of the sunken vessels sticking above the water. Amherst's men are working like demons building a road for the cannon across the marsh and trenching up to the back wall, but they work only at night and undiscovered by the French till the ninth of July. Then the French rush out with a whoop to drive them off, but the English already have their guns mounted, and Drucourt's men are glad to dash for shelter behind the cracking walls. It now became a game of cannon play pure and simple. Boscawan from harbor front hurls his whistling bombs overhead to crash through roofs inside the walls. Wolf from the lighthouse battery throws shells and flaming combustibles straight into the midst of the remaining French fleet. At last, on July 21st, masts, sails, tar ropes take fire in a terrible conflagration and three of the fleet burn to the waterline with terrific explosions of their powder magazines. Then the flames hiss out above the rocking hulls. Only two ships are left to the French, and the deep bomb-proof casements inside the fort between outer and inner walls where the families and the wounded have been sheltered 
are now in flame. Amherst loads his shells with combustibles and pours one continuous rain of fiery death on the doomed fort. The houses, which are of logs, flame like kindling wood, and now the timber work of the stone bastion is burning from bombs hurtling through the roofs. The walls crash down in masses. The scared surgeons, all bloody from amputating shattered limbs, no longer stand in safety above their operating tables. It is said that Madame Drucourt, the governor's wife, actually stayed on the walls to encourage the soldiers, with her own hands fired some of the great guns, and when the overworked surgeons flagged from terror and lack of sleep, it was Madame Drucourt who attended to the wounded. Drucourt is for holding out to the death, until one dark night the English row into the harbor and capture his last two ships. Then Drucourt asks for terms. July 26. But the terms are stern, utter surrender, and Drucourt would have fought till every man fell from the walls, had not one of the civil officers rushed after the commander's messenger carrying the refusal and shouted across the ditches to the English, We accept, we surrender, we accept your terms. Counting soldiers, marines, and townspeople, in all five thousand French pass over to Amherst to be carried prisoners on Boscawen's fleet to England. Wolfe was for proceeding at once to Quebec, but Amherst considered the season too late and determined to complete the work where he was. One detachment goes to receive the surrender of Isle St. John, henceforth known as Prince Edward Island. Another division proceeds up St. John River, New Brunswick, burning all settlements that refuse unconditional surrender. Wolfe's grenadiers are sent to reduce Gaspé and Miramachi and northern New Brunswick, and now least blundering statecraft for a second time return the captured fort to France. Amherst and Boscawen order the complete disarmament and destruction of Louisburg. What cannon cannot be removed are tumbled into the marsh or upset into the sea. The stones from the walls are carried away to Halifax. By 1760, of Louisburg, the glory of New France, the pride of America, there remains not a vestige but grass slopes overgrown by nettles, ditches with rank growth of weeds, stone piles where the wild vines grow, and an inner yard where the cows of the fisherfolk pasture. Not a poor beginning for the campaign of 1758, though bad enough news has come from Major General Abercrombie, which was the real explanation of Amherst's refusal to push on to Quebec. Abercrombie, with 15,000 men, the pick of the regulars and provincials, had launched out on Lake George on the 5th of July with over 1,000 boats to descend the lake northward to the French fort of Carillon or Ticacondra. Again it would require artist's brush to paint the scene. Rogers' rangers, dressed in buckskin, led the way in birch canoes. Lord Howe was there, dressed like a bushfighter, and with bagpipes setting the echoes ringing amid the lonely mountains were the highland regiments in their tartan plaids. Flags floated from the prow of every boat. Each battalion had its own regimental band. Scarcely a breath dimpled the waters of the lake, and the sun shone without a cloud. Little wonder those who passed through the fiery acladema that was to come afterwards look back on this scene as the fairest in their lives. Montcalm had only arrived at Ticonderoga on June 30th. There was no doubting the news. His bushrovers brought in word that the English were advancing in such multitudes their boats literally covered the lake. It looked as if the fate of Fort William Henry were to be reversed. 
Montcalm never dreamed of Abercrombie attacking without artillery. To stay cooped up in the fort would invite destruction. Therefore Montcalm ordered his men out to construct a circular breastwork from the river of the Chutes on the southeast, which empties Lake George, round towards Lake Champlain on the northwest. Huge trees were felled, pile on pile, topmost branches spiked and pointed outwards. Behind these Montcalm entrenched his four thousand men, lying in lines three deep, with grenadiers in reserve behind to step up as the foremost lines fell. At a cannon signal from the fort the men were to rise to their places, but not to fire till the English were entangled in the brushwood. It was blistering hot weather. It is said that the troops took off their heavy three-cornered hats and lay in their shirt sleeves, hand on musket, speaking no word but waiting. On came the English in martial array, pausing in the narrows at five o'clock for the troops' evening meal, moving on before daylight of July 6 to the landing place. The rangers had brought in word that Levy was coming post haste to Montcalm's aid. Abercrombie thought to defeat Montcalm before reinforcements could come, and now he committed his cardinal error. He advanced across the portage without his heavy artillery. Halfway over, the voice of the French scouts rang out. Who goes there? French, answered the English soldiers. But the French were not tricked. The ambushed scouts fired. Lord Howe, the very spirit of the English army, dropped dead, shot through the breast, though the English avenged his loss by cutting the French scouts to pieces. On the night of the 7th, the English army bivouacked in sight of the French barricade. Promptly at 12 o'clock next day, a cannon shot from Titicondra brought every Frenchman behind the tree line to his place at a leap. Abercrombie had ordered his men to rush the barricade. There was fearful silence till the English were within twenty paces of the trees. There they broke from quick march to a rung with a wild halloo. Death unerring blazed from the French barricade. Not bullets only, but broken glass and ragged metal that tore hideous wounds in the ranks of the English. Caught in the brushwood, unable even to see their foes, the maddened troop wavered and fell back. Again Abercrombie roared the order to charge. Six times they hurled themselves against the impassable wall, and six times the sharpshooters behind the lines met the advance with a rain of fire. The Highland troops to the right went almost mad. Lord John Murray, their commander, had fallen, and not a tenth of their number remained unwounded. But the broadswords wrought small havoc against their sprite branches of the log barricade. Obstinate as he was stupid, Abercrombie kept his men at the bloody but futile attempt till the sun had set behind the mountains etching the sad scene with the long painted shadows. Already almost two thousand English had fallen, seven hundred killed, the rest wounded. The French behind the barricade, where Montcalm marched up and down in his short sleeves, grimmed with smoke, encouraging the men, had lost less than four hundred. In a spirit of hilarious bravado, a young Frenchman sprang to the top of the barricade and waved a coat on the end of his bayonet. Mistaking it for a flag of surrender, the English ceased firing and dashed up with muskets held on the horizontal above heads. They were actually scaling the wall when a French officer, realizing the blunder, roared, Shoot! Shoot, you fools! Don't you see these men will seize you? End of section 27. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.